You're listening to the Good Question Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Our goal is to make each of our guests exclaim, hmm, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. Because when that happens, it means you, the listener, may be inspired to learn more beyond the interview and to ask great questions yourself that lead to new insights. In this podcast, we cover historical and current anthropology, comparative religion, and history. Welcome, and let's get started. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with Good Question Podcast. I've got a really great guest, David Berlinski. He's an author of at least 10 books. One of the most recent ones is called Human Nature. So we're going to talk about that a little bit and some of his other works. He's essentially, I guess what I would consider uh, in the terms of thought, a polymath. He's written books on again, the history of mathematics and algorithms and you know the scientific method and, uh, and now human nature. So welcome, David. Thank you for coming. It's my pleasure entirely. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, tell me a bit about your history. What prompted you to write books on all these topics that probably would scare anyone to even write a book about one of them? Well, I began as an academic. Uh, I went to Princeton for my graduate degree, and then I taught at Stanford. And I did some mathematics, especially mathematical logic at Stanford. And then I decided that destiny was really calling me outside of the academic world. So I left Stanford. And I bounced around. I think that's the only fair, fair way to describe it. I joined McKinsey as a consultant for a year and discovered I was manifestly unsuited for management consulting. And it's a, it is a very difficult discipline. Don't get me wrong. I'm not being cynical when I say that. The fault was mine, not McKinsey's. And I worked uh, for the city of New York as a senior quantitative analyst dealing with uh, a $2 billion budget, another enterprise for which I was remarkably unsuited. And then little by little, I returned to the academic world, but of course, nowhere near the level of distinction of a Princeton or Stanford. It comprised rather a descending employment list until finally I decided I would rather try to live by writing than uh, pursue anything but a fragmentary academic career. And I followed that path pretty much until the present. I don't know whether it is a coherent history, but it's pretty realistic. That is the story. Mm. So, uh, you know, you've delved deep into a lot of different major topics in the world. Again, the history of algorithms, the history of, of mathematics, et cetera. What's your overall feel after spending so much time looking into all these deep concepts? Do you feel like you have a, a better or more nuanced understanding of the world and of science? Or, I mean, what's it like for you to to be here after writing all these books and learning all these things? Well, only way, honestly, to answer a question of that sort is to say, sure, I know more than I did when I was starting out at the age of 21. I'm 80 now. I just turned 80. And of course, there's been an improvement in certain kinds of understanding. But with that improvement comes, I think, the dawning realization. It's never a completely fulfilled realization. The areas of darkness and in penetrability are remarkably large, much larger than I ever anticipated. And that the kinds of answers that I thought would be accessible when I was 21, 22, doing mathematical logic at Stanford, don't seem quite as accessible to me now. I find the progress of science as a human institution exhilarating and magnificent, that's for sure. But whether the progress of science is quite commensurate with the claims made in its behalf is quite another question. I'm doubtful. It seems to me the more detailed, the more powerful, the more ingenious, the more mathematically sophisticated our theories are, the greater the primitive questions that remain. They haven't disappeared, and they are troubling. I think that's, that's a fairly rational assessment. What are some of the questions that maybe have been on your mind and plagued you for decades that really there's no, I don't know, there's no good answer to still, but maybe you have some insight on? Well, I've spent so much time teaching mathematics and thinking about mathematics, and yet in a very fundamental sense, I don't know what mathematics is about. A fundamental sense. What are the objects or the properties that mathematics treats? Plainly, the numbers are not physical objects. You can't kick a number. Are you also willing to say that the numbers are not temporal objects? You can't date the appearance of the number three in the cosmos. Well, if they're not physical and they're not temporal, 
are they somehow beyond the universe, the physical universe? And if they are beyond the physical universe, could there be other things beyond the physical universe? I don't suggest that I have an answer to that question, but I think it's a very good question to ask because mathematics is, after all, the deepest, the richest, the most profound, and the most successful body of intellectual work the human race has ever achieved. It's much larger in scope than physics. And there it is, on some fundamental sense, I find myself perplexed by its existence. Perplexed in a very odd way, that is, I cannot give any coherent account of what it would be to be in the universe without mathematics. The creation of numbers, as Thierry of Schott said in the 13th century, was the creation of things. To talk about a world without mathematics is to talk about a world without things, and I cannot imagine that, because like you, I am too a thing. So it's a a difficult question even to make precise, but that doesn't mean it's an unimportant or trivial question. It's obviously a question of some depth. What do you think of the following concept? You know, uh, some nightclubs will have like a velvet ropes outside them and the bouncers only let certain people in. I've noticed in science and in math, there seems to be certain velvet ropes I don't think we'll ever cross. You know, we, we may never get to absolute zero. We may never travel even close to the speed of light. We may never get to 99% of the universe. We may never be able to see an atom or see a quark, for instance. What what are your thoughts on that, that there seem to be these velvet ropes that exist that we can't go beyond? Well, I don't know about velvet ropes and nightclubs, but I, I can certainly agree with you that there are boundaries that we seem to be approaching no matter where we look. In fact, there's a whole body of results. And this is the really interesting points, which make specific and detailed the nature of those boundaries. For example, in logic, we know there's an absolute boundary with respect to proof that certain very simple systems involving only the whole numbers are such that there will always be something that the system cannot reach, an unprovable statement. And there are lots of comparable statements, uh, often called no-go theorems in physics, too, things that cannot be done. Far more interesting than the existence of those boundaries is the fact that human ingenuity and mathematical sophistication has given us a very rich body of uh, deductive results about their nature. That's very stimulating, that we should be able simultaneously to recognize certain certain, uh, boundaries that we cannot cross and at the same time characterize them very precisely. That's an achievement of the 20th century. It's a great achievement of the 20th century, and the names are very familiar, Gödel, Tarski, Carnap, lots of figures in that tradition. Yeah, I guess the more we can describe these boundaries, the further science can advance, and the more we'll know regardless, even if we can't go beyond them. I think it's true to, to call it an advance, that an honorific, which I don't dispute in any way. But in a very deep level, they are suggesting that intelligence such as we possess, that is human beings, has certain kinds of limits. It has a a tremendous capacity, no doubt about that. The the scientific capacity is extraordinary. The literary and artistic capacities are extraordinary, but they too are bounded in just the same way that every animal uh, on the face of the earth has extraordinary capacities. Think of a, a cheetah and how fast the cheetah can run but also very severe limitations. And we too have very severe limitations. What is extraordinary, I know I'm repeating myself, but it's worth hearing, is the fact that we have the ingenuity to characterize our own limitations. Same thing is true in language, by the way. Oh, what do you mean? Well, there are only certain kinds of uh, systems that count as a human language. Although they're perfectly plausible alternatives, we can't use them, we can't learn them. But we can characterize that boundary with increasing sophistication. And this is a great achievement of modern linguistics. It's it's very recent, only dates to the 1950s. We know certain kinds of structures could perfectly well be used by Martians, but we can't use them. But we can describe them. That's remarkable. Hmm. So what are some of the questions that that maybe, you know, nag at you or plague you over all this time? Which ones do you feel like, um, I don't know, you, you like to bring up and discuss that you'd you just you don't have as much insight into them as you wish. Well, I think I would characterize myself as someone not markedly tempted by anxiety with respect to intellectual questions. I'm very devoted to them, but none of them really keep me up late at night. I think the most interesting questions, 
you're very right in remarking this, deal with boundaries, both in logic and mathematics, and to a certain extent in physics, but also the topics that I've increasingly been concerned with, say, the last 10 years, questions about history and social relations. I also think there are tremendously important and fairly interesting intellectual issues which represent something of the same phenomena, the discovery of boundaries. Human nature, for example, I think that's a, an interesting example. You know, there's a tremendous, tremendous uh, chatter and controversy all over the internet, which is where most controversy and chatter takes place about human nature, its parameters, whether it exists, what are its limitations? Can those limitations be crossed? And for the most part, it's perfectly true. The discussions are trivial or not, not focused, not well argued. But it is uh, almost ubiquitous in the West, I can't speak for Russia or China or Latin America, to come to the conclusion that this is a tremendously serious issue. And it, it really is. The question, is there such a thing as human nature? And can we describe it? On that question, a great many uh, secondary questions hang. So what have you discovered as some of the key tenets of human nature that you know, perhaps you discuss in your human nature book? Or what are some of the key questions that you want to bring, off, bring up? It's very clear that there is a distinction to be made between talking about uniformities in human society and human history, things that appear all over the place. For example, marriage. Another example, family. Third example, binary gender distinctions. Fourth example, trivial but obvious, clothing. There is no society without clothing. Some form of apprehension about nakedness seems to be universal. But a quite different issue is whether these universal features are necessary in the sense, not that they take place or are obvious all the time, but must be the way they are. That's quite a different, different question. It's a much more difficult question. For example, it's clear that the human species is quite distinct from other species on the planet, quite distinct. Although everyone likes to say we are among the animals, which is perfectly true, but also perfectly trivial. It's hard to think of another species as radically distinct from all other species as the human species. Human beings are markedly outliers in the biological panorama. And the, dis the difference between human beings and our nearest ancestors is quite remarkable. It's not a trivial difference. No matter how many times we train oh, a chimpanzee or an ape to mimic a human achievement, babbling a few sy syllables or typing out or learning a, a few uh, signs in American Sign Language, the difference remains. That is very suggestive. It's very much unexplained by evolutionary theory why there should be this radical disjunction between human beings and the rest of the animal kingdom. All sorts of answers are possible. From it was a random accident, that's one answer, or the classical answer going back to the Greeks and amplified throughout the religious tradition, that human beings are created in a way that animals are not created in the image of the divine. To my way of thinking, yep. all of these possible responses are not equally plausible, but they're equally accessible to investigation. I don't think any of them should be ruled out. Yeah, I was going to ask you in terms of spirituality, where are you now after all that you've learned? What are your thoughts? I don't know. Where am I now <laughs> spiritually? I have no idea. Have a good time all the time. That sounds good to me. So there's been no, um, you, you haven't come to faith no or you haven't pushed away from faith? You don't know? No spiritual evolution, are you asking? No, I'm afraid not. Okay. Um, in terms of evolution, I know I've heard you discuss it with you know Peter Robinson on Uncommon Knowledge. What's your thought on like the neo-Darwinist framework and how it seems to be, uh, you know, it's become a dogma and it seems to suppress and push out other alternatives, you know, in, in well, science, how do you, how do you see it affecting it? It's become a dogma and I, I have really little to say about the sociology of dogmatic formation. I, I've talked a lot about that, but the interesting thing is, is otherwise it's, it's a matter of the intellectual credibility of the dogma. And here I think my position today in 2022 is not appreciably different from my position, say, 20 or 30 years ago. I think we should be asking the biological community to do a whole lot better. I don't think we can be satisfied 
with the tremendous spectacle of theoretical physics in front of our eyes, with the theory that says, yeah, random accidents and natural, that's not enough. That's not enough for, for people who want a serious account of life on Earth or life in the universe for that matter. It may, it may just be one phenomenon in the universe, living systems, which are the same no matter where, or it may be a, a variety of different living systems, but to take neo-Darwinism as a, an explanation as complete and as profound, as compelling as the standard model of particle physics seems to me uh, completely unwise. Unwise socially, unwise intellectually, unwise as a matter of university attitudes, and unwise uh, as a matter of uh, sheer curiosity. The thing just doesn't explain all that much. Well, why do you think it's become so entrenched and it's, it's dictated what people are allowed to publish and not publish? And why does it shape science so deeply? It's convenient. Look, Darwin posed a problem he could not properly articulate. That is the origin of living species. He couldn't define a species, neither can we for that matter. He didn't have the tools adequately to describe the genetic mechanism of speciation. His book on the origin of species was largely rhetorical. Um, the theory remains largely unfalsifiable in any considerable detail. Yeah, there are obvious cases where we would say this is incompatible with Darwinian theory, a real case of spontaneous creation. Were we privileged to witness it would be an example. But those, those are not the deep issues. The question you're asking is, what bends first a scientific community and second, the entire intellectual literary community to drop its knee in favor of a particular theory? And it's, it's a good question, but it's really a sociological question. And my guess would be that a lot of it was driven by the remarkable ingenuity with which the neo-Darwinian hypothesis was formed in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s by Fisher, Holden, and Wright. That was a triumph of mathematical ingenuity, the reconciliation of Mendelian genetics with the original ideas that Darwin advanced in 1859. That was a real triumph, and people assumed that one triumph inevitably served to predict a whole sequence of triumphs. I think that was, to a certain extent, a natural mistake, but it was a mistake. But in the second place, Darwin served very adequately as a replacement theory, very adequately. After all, what was the prevailing assumption before Darwin about the appearance of living system? It was largely religious. It was largely theological. Darwin's ideas, published first in 1859, did not immediately triumph. By the time they gained real ascendancy, much of Europe, especially Western Europe, and much of the United States was undertaking the long march towards secularism. And with secularism came inevitably a demotion of religious thought. And with the increasing sophistication of physical and mathematical thought came an ancillary demotion of the sophistication of theological thought, which at first glance seems mythic, committed to a fab a fable rather than the kind of solid inquiry that one sees in the physical sciences. I don't agree that that's true. I think there's some extraordinarily sophisticated thinking that's part of the theological tradition, but it's easy to see why that happened in a society becoming increasingly secular. Increasingly secular society nonetheless has to face the question, we're living on a planet that's swarming with life, what's the proper explanation? We deny that it could be religious because we are secular in nature. We do not turn toward deities for our ultimate explanations. Well, if we're secular, we can't very well say we have no idea how life arose. What a lucky break. There is a theory that explains how life arose and how it diversified. It behooves us to embrace it. And that's exactly what I think a lot of intellectuals and sophisticated people did. They just embrace it because it serves so many ancillary needs. Yeah, it makes sense. Do you think the world's going to continue to get more secular, or do you think there may be a return to you know, spirituality or religion? I think that a large extent, as far as we can see, secularism is a one-way road. I think it'll be a long time, a long time, if ever, where that road becomes two-way again, two ways again. Oh, wow. What do you think? Good. 
The most prophetic book about this is, I think, by far and away, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. And he predicted the consequences of secularism with a kind of uh, horrifying vividness. And we see it all around us. Do you see pockets of religion popping up that'll be refuges oh, for people yeah. that don't embrace secularism? That's an undying human impulse. Norman Cantor, professor of history at Columbia, used to say, religious experience takes two forms, a desire to conquer the world or a desire to retreat from the world. We've seen quasi-religious movements in the 20th century, and communism certainly was a quasi-religious movement, and it set out to conquer the world, and it failed miserably. I think what's taking place today is here and there, perhaps to a larger extent than I can see. You know, I have a very limited perspective. There are something like monastic communities forming in the way, say, that at the end of the Roman Empire, Benedictine monasteries began to form. Here and there, I have very serious doubts whether there will be an efflorescence of monastic life as there was in the Middle Ages. I doubt it. I think the pull of secularism is overwhelming. The pull of personal indulgence, the satisfaction of desire, the ambition to live for one's individuality, the great wish to occupy oneself with sensual central pleasures, this is a fairly dominating set of attitudes, and we see it everywhere. So where do you think uh, secularism is headed? Is it going to take new forms or are we just, are we just going to continue? Are we at the peak of it in its expression? Nowhere near. For the last 10 years, I think a um, great many people have, have asked themselves the question, if I wish to be all that I can be, is there any limitation on the length of life, the form in which my identity is embodied, the sex in which I find myself, even the species in which I, I am occupied. If, in fact, secularism is the driving force, there is a natural push against all those boundaries, which brings the discussion right back to human nature. We can see the push everywhere against those boundaries. Is it a matter of tradition, habit? Are those boundaries simply matters of tradition, habit, custom, history? Or do they reflect something necessary in human life? That is perhaps the most important question we can be asking right now. Have exactly. other thinkers besides yourself putting, put forth these questions or do you feel like you're alone and kind of contemplating them? Are there any voices right now that are, you know, that have good things to say about these issues? I like to think of myself as standing in lonely grandeur. <laughs> well, well, go ahead. What other conjectures do you have? Well, I'm fascinated by, by um, how difficult it is overpoweringly to argue against certain trends in contemporary society. The issue of free speech is an obvious example. It's, it's, uh, it's painful to me as, uh, of course, someone in theory committed to free speech to see how poorly it's defended. And my natural question is, is there a much better defense? And to tell you the truth, I'm not sure I know the answer to that. That's just one, one issue. Another issue that not many people are talking about, but it has hit the level of popular attention. If we can at will change our sex, go from male to female, or female to male, can we at will change our race, our skin color, our age? Could someone at age 50 say he feels 20 and claim the full force of legal protection for a 20-year-old identity? And the most yeah. powerful of all these, these issues what about the barrier between species? Could a human being be a turtle, for example? Oh, yes, that's absurd. Who wants, well, suppose somebody did want desires, after all, are infinite, were filled with infinite longings. Suppose somebody conceived the desire, as a man conceives the desire to be a woman, conceives the desire to be a turtle. What do we say about that? I'm not asking for a legal opinion. I'm asking for a philosophical defense, either of the claim that being restricted to a human body has just been a traditional accomplishment of the human race. And if we decide otherwise, we're perfectly free to violate the species boundary. We just have to wish it ardently enough. Or do we say, oh. no, a human being who wishes to become a turtle or otherwise a reptile cannot become a turtle or otherwise a reptile, because it is impossible. That's a much more difficult argument, really to pound into the ground. Obviously, it's absurd. I designed the argument to sound absurd. But if you start thinking about it, 
and you and you really try to uh, address these issues with the kind of diligence you would otherwise apply to issues of social justice, it becomes very fraught. All of a sudden, the ground yeah. starts shaking, the ground starts trembling. Are, are we going to be driven back to a doctrine of necessity that philosophically we can't quite defend, but historically, emotionally, and socially, we see is absolutely vital? Good question. Yeah, I've seen people on the news throughout the years saying that, you know, this guy is the lizard man, this guy is this person has modified their body to, you know, because they feel like they're a cat. I mean, you know, I'm sure a lot of people would, these, no, these are very extreme examples, but I've seen some. I beg to differ. Those examples are perfectly clear. Some guy makes, puts a leathery skin on top of himself or sticks two horns on his forehead and claims to be some sort of a reptile. We see what that is. It's a human being pretending to be something that's not human. The question goes deeper. Is the boundary between being a human being and being a reptile, necessarily uncrossable. Could he really be a reptile or a frog simply by demanding the right to cross that boundary? Or is there some iron law that like an iron gate mounts in front of our eyes and says, no, it is not simply unaccustomed. It is impossible. The way that two plus two equals five is impossible. If we say that's impossible, what's to stop us from saying the desires of a man who wishes to be, not to pretend to be, but to be a woman, are similarly impossible? How do we distinguish those cases? And if we can yes. distinguish them, what's to stop us from saying gender identity is not only a fact of life and a fact of history in every culture, it is a fact of nature. That's just a much more powerful argument. There is well, no possible world. No possible world in which you, Richard, could be a reptile. You could pretend to be, oh yeah, I can pretend to be anything. I can pretend to be Napoleon. But there's no word, no possible world in which I actually could be Napoleon or you actually could be a frog. Yeah, I agree. And then, yeah, the issue of gender. Yeah, it's, that that's was a the... remarkably easy victory, polemical victory. Are you sure you agree? I agree with what you said so far. Um, historically, have there been any any circumstances wherein people said, I am this and I am not a human or I'm not what I am, you know, prima facie, and it's gone far enough where there was really accepted to get anywhere, where it just kind of comes and goes, these statements from people. Well, are you willing to accept the same argument? I mean, don't forget, you said you agree. Are you willing to accept the same driving force of the argument with respect to others of your desire? I take it for granted that you have no wish to become a frog. But is that true of your other desires, that there may well be necessary limitations on them? Yeah, I'd like to live a long time, not forever, but I'd like to live a long time. But there's a, a fundamental limit that everyone seems to run up against. So yeah, yeah there's, there's plenty of things like that. But if you decide that you wish to live forever, have you taken a decision that is unlikely to be achieved or impossible to be achieved? Are you willing to declare that you agree with my arguments right now? I don't think you're quite as willing as you suggest you are. I, I think the, the implications of these kinds of arguments drive deep into the ground. Everyone can say, you know, Richard, he ain't going to be no fraud. Fine. No. Fine. But when we talk about human desires and the demands for transformation, that's something quite different. I mean, suppose I were to offer you today a pill that would augment your intelligence by 200 IQ points. You take the pill, you appear on this podcast, remarkably more intelligent than anyone on the planet. Mm. Would that still be you? Or is it being you necessarily someone who has roughly the history that you have, the ancestry that you had, the potential that you have, but also the limitations that you have? I think at first it would be me, but then it would rapidly change me into something that's not me, that's different, that when well, I underwent something like that. If it's not you, then you agree there are necessary limits to what you can achieve by way of transformation. Yeah, oh, yeah, I agree with that totally, yes. There are definitely limits. Suppose we start descending. I gave you 200 IQ points to begin with, but you know that's an inductive argument. Shave one, and then if you shave one, why not shave another one? Could your intelligence change by a fraction of a percentage? Have you still remain you? Could your emotional attitudes 
change by some small percentage. So peaceful as you've been, agreeable as you are, you suddenly develop certain odd pathologies, a streak of vivid aggressiveness. At what point would the lovely and noble thing commonly referred to by the name of Richard become something other? Is there such a point? Or is mutability the general rule? If there is such a point, why can't you cross it and still remain you? We have yeah, we get we get back to the idea of boundaries again and the fuzziness of, of boundaries and what it looks like when we approach them and what they are. Well, it's not only the fuzziness of boundaries, but their nature. I mean, the question that I I keep focusing on is whether those boundaries simply reflect the accretions of history. From time immemorial, women have tended to wear brighter colors than men. Now, nobody says that's necessary. In fact, you can look very carefully there. Here and there, there are pockets. For example, the Japanese courts of the uh, 11th century, men were fantastically colored clothing, silk clothing, as well as women. But by and large, that seems to be a generalization. Men, most of the time, prefer subdued colors with respect to women. Most of the time, men don't paint their lips. Now, nobody, I think, would argue that's because it's impossible for men to paint their lips. It's a matter of history. It's a matter of tradition. It's a matter of custom. It's a matter of certain attitudes toward facial pain. But it is not like the case of a man who proposes to become a frog. That's a quite different case. So this distinction, which I think many people are grappling with, with good or bad uh, arguments or sincere or insincere, seems to me very important. And if it is a valid distinction, we do need a much richer theory of what necessity comes to in these contexts. Um, We're talking about the modal attributes, must, could, might. We're not talking about what is. Everybody, I think, has rather stern intuitions when we see some six foot six swimmer entering a, a women's swim meet, thrashing the opposition and claiming to be a woman throughout. My question is, is what he's doing simply a rejection of common life, or is it undertaking an impossibility? As if a mathematician would say two plus two equals five. We know what that is. That's a contradiction. Cannot be two plus two. It's not that there's one world in which two plus two equals four and another world in which two plus two equals five. No, there's no world in which two and two sum to five. Similarly, you might argue there's no world in which a man can become a woman. None in the whole universe of possible worlds. Mm. Therefore, anybody who pretends to be doing that is guilty of bad faith. If we cannot make that argument, then he's guilty of violating a cultural norm, and cultural norms change. They seem to be changing in front of our eyes. So it's not a trivial question, not at all. No, that's true. I mean, I don't know if a debate will be supported on it in today's day and age, but it's definitely, uh, yeah, it's, it's not a simple question. I understand. So what what other major uh, elements have you contemplated in human nature? This sounds like it's one of them, but is there is there any other topic that really, I don't know, has bedeviled you or that was important for you to write about in Human Nature book? Well, I think the 20th century has occupied me more than any other subject. And I've written a lot about the 20th century because here we are, 2022. It still seems to me, as someone born in 1942, that the 20th century never ended. It didn't really end. In the way the 19th century, we can date the end of the 19th century to the minute. It was August 1914, the 19th century ended. And a brand new experience and a terrible experience in human history began. There is something that remains to be understood about the 20th century, best expressed by the question, why was it so terrible? With all the advances, all the progress that human societies had made in the 19th century, and all the expectation that the 20th century would be even better, richer, more affordable, more luxurious, filled pleasures that were inaccessible in the 19th century, and in any event featuring much better sanitation, one of the great triumphs of the late 19th century, why did that expectation collapse in the way it did? From 1914 to 1945, that is the First World War to the end of Hitler's attempt to conquer the world, Current estimates are not reliable, but they're not off by orders of magnitude, something like 250 million excess deaths. That's an astonishing number. We're only talking tonight, uh, talking about the period to, until 1945. We're not talking about 
Chinese Communist Revolution. We're not talking about Pol Pot. We're not talking about Vietnam. We're not talking about the latter horrors of the 20th century. What's the estimate on the excess debts for the entire 20th century? Is it a billion or more? No, it's nowhere near that. A billion would be un- unthinkable. No, it's it's uh, perhaps around 300 million excess debts. But using those estimates, that's one of the things that is, is so conspicuous an intellectual failing century. With all the statistical sophistication of the 20th century, we can't even count the dead. First World War, I've seen estimates go from 10 to 20 million dead in the First World War. Very good mm-hmm. historian. I'm not faulting the historians, but what I try to check their references to, Clark spoke about the First World War, as an example, the sleepwalkers. There's no reference. He's just repeating what some other historian has said. I know from looking at the documentary record, the United States has very good statistical tracking for its it dead in combat. So does France, so did Germany. With Italy, it all starts to waver. With Central Europe, it's hopeless. With Russia, who knows? Who knows? Dead in, in, in China between 1912 and 2022, I defy anyone to come up with honest statistics. Just not possible. So that, that I felt is an indictment of the 20th century. Is it not that we are aware of tremendous horrors that took place, but we're not able with any degree of rigor to count them? And that's really the first task of a, anyone interested in history, to count things accurately. We can't do it. We can't do damage either. How much damage was caused to the German language by the Holocaust? I guess I have a bigger question. What percentage of history do you think is accurate? Very little. <laughs> Which is scary. Like, what, what percentage do you think is actually accurate? It's weird. Well, look, I can't talk about history in general. All I can talk about are historical inquiries I've made myself. Mm. Uh, there's a very familiar claim in the literature of criminology that there's been an 800 year decline in violence. Steven Pinker, for example, has made that claim. Say from 1200 to the 20th century, interpersonal violence, that is violence taking place one individual against another, not state violence, has declined very dramatically. Oh, it goes down like a rocket, which had previously gone up. I spent two or three years looking at the sources all of which are are beautifully online now. You don't have to go to libraries as much as you previously had to go to libraries. And I found the records for medieval Europe from the 12th and 13th century. Um, And I discovered to my amazement, they did nothing to support this claim that homicide rates were way higher in the Middle Ages than they were in in the 20th century. In fact, there is no 800-year decline in violence. There is violence, there's homicide, there are cities which... Homicides are great, cities in which homicides are low. Certainly homicide rates in certain 13th century English cities are not out of line with homicide rates in certain 20th century American cities, New Orleans, Baltimore, Los Angeles, Mm. Chicago. And that was a revelation. The thesis of an 800 800 year is not only wrong when measured against homicide rates, it is completely wrong. The data the evidence, the documents just do not support it. Hmm. That is uh, kind of a depressing conclusion to agree. It, it does make me very skeptical about a lot of historical literature. Um, of course, I don't have a choice about something about the Tang Dynasty. I have to look to a Chinese expert. The one issue where I try to, to get come to grips with the statistical record as it existed, that is the Anshan Revolution in the 8th century, which is frequently claimed to have uh, consumed 35 million lives, any attempt to find a solid statistical basis just crumbles to dust in your finger. Hmm. Just crumbles. Well, I mean, so maybe it's not so terrible. Maybe this just says that human nature, you know, violence hasn't gone down, for instance, then human nature has prevailed over a very long time scale. What's wrong with that? I certainly think the form violence takes may change. For example, in the 20th century, you can make a pretty convincing case that Germany in 1938 had homicides rates that were as low as the lowest point in the 19th century, and the homicide rate has remained unchanged. Nobody in his right mind would claim that's evidence that Germany was not a violent society at the time. People who talk about homicide in the 20th century always ignore the First and Second World War described as outliers when they talk about deaths in combat, and they ignore 
state-directed violence when they talk about homicide rates. For example, London in 1948 had a homicide rate of roughly one homicide per 100,000 individuals, which is considered just about as low as it can go. But yet, five years earlier, there were plenty of cities in Central Europe and in Western Europe where the reverse was true. The certainty of death approached one in Poland, if you happen to be Jewish. Hmm. It approached one. That's an incredible fact that simply does not figure in popular accounts of the decline of violence. Interesting. Okay. So when you look at what's really going on, again, what kind of a picture does it paint for you? Does it mean that, again, human nature has been the, the salient factor that's really governed everything that's happened, no matter how we try to obfuscate it or you know, maybe change history or report about it differently? I think uh, it's probably a good idea to take the concept of a necessary human nature seriously and do what so much of human society has done in the past, and that is make the attempt to build barricades against its worst impulses and support its best impulses. And this was the standard view dominating Europe since the time of the Greeks, that human beings have to be educated, they must be disciplined in, in accepting social restrictions on their behavior, they must be incessantly exhorted to appeal to their better nature, not their worst nature, and there must be fairly strict systems of control and domination that prevent people from doing what they so remarkably would like to do if given the chance, and that is to kill a lot of other people. And we see that in the Holocaust. We see that in Stalin's Russia. That people have given the chance, oh, they'll, they'll just go at, at extermination with gusto. The only way to protect against that is to build uh, a very complex legal and social system. Well, very good. David, I don't want you know, I know, I know you could talk for a very long time. Oh, we have a lot of experience in areas. I want to say, don't interrupt me now. I'm just starting. <laughs> Well, we are going to run into a time constraint soon. What super important things that you want to, uh, you know, bring up before we, we would end in the next maybe ten minutes or so? Oh, I I feel reluctant to to make that judgment myself. I mean, we, so far okay. we've just been talking about things we both find interesting. Hmm. But, uh, and this, well, in terms of uh, future future topics, you know, the next book that you're, I would guess maybe you're working on. What what is it about? What it's what so things do you feel like is, you need to write about? Still, so much of that is luck. I would. I don't want to write another book about mathematics like the book, the books that I've already written. But there are some topics in slightly more advanced mathematics that I would like to make more accessible. Maybe that's the word. I'd like to, uh, to give them a greater degree of accessibility and to the extent that I can put my own touch on them. I've always been fascinated, for example, by the borel cantelli lemma, which is a lemma in probability theory. And, uh, oh, of course, it's well known. It's not at the forefront of anything. It's a part of establishment. But I don't quite mm. feel that it's been expounded in the way I would like to see it expounded. And it, it struck me maybe I'll do something like that. On the other hand, I have a good friend, a mathematician from Princeton, and he and I were thinking of writing a, a much more popular, is not quite, quite the word, but a much less technical account of uh, what we both take to be a dogma, the notion that materialism is entirely an adequate philosophy. Uh, now, I, I know you're going to ask me what do I mean by materialism, and I'm going to answer, I'm not sure. Mm. But I think it's a governing part of contemporary intellectual discourse, the, the idea that the world of matter is the world that matters. And I think it's wrong, and I think a certain number of philosophers agree that it's wrong. But I'd like to make the case, not so much from the point of view of physics, I, I really don't know much physics, but from the point of view of mathematics, it returns us to the beginning of the discussion, how, how many fundamental questions about the nature of mathematics are not understood, not yet, not by me in any case. So those are possibilities. Of course, I'm neglecting to mention that I'm, I might turn my hand to lyric poetry. That always seems suitable. Well, do so, you feel like you've put forth enough material and now it's just kind of what, what piques your curiosity or are there, are there some super important things that you still want to discuss and have to discuss? Forget about important things that I have to discuss. Uh, people in my position write for a living. Hmm. As Dr. Johnson said, none but a blockhead writes but for money. Hmm. Well, very good. Uh, 
David, what's the best way for someone to dip their toe in with all your books and all the material on you that's out there? Where do you suggest they start? I think the best book that I've ever written, in my judgment, is The Devil's Delusion, Atheism and Its Scientific Pretension. I had the most control over the medium. The most charming book, or the book that seems to give the most pleasure, is A Tour of the Calculus, which I would rewrite today in a, in a way that's commensurate with my age. But I think people really take a lot of pleasure in finally coming to grips with uh, the calculus as a mathematical subject. In between, I don't know, maybe read a couple of my novels. That works too. Well, very good. David, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. And you know, I guess one of the difficulties or, or fun things that is involved with speaking to someone with your range is there's so many things that could be talked about. Is Next it possible time. to zoom in on one? Next time, we'll talk about other, other things. <laughs> Very good. Well, again, David, thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. You take care. Thank you for listening to the Good Question Podcast. Please email support at thegoodquestionpodcast.com if you have any referrals to great guests for us to interview. Visit thegoodquestionpodcast.com to hear more interviews. And please help us spread the word by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen to this podcast.